some engineering problems have more than one design variable. As a matter of fact, they all have more than one design variable. For the purpose of convenience, we're going to call the first design variable x1 and the second design variable x2 so that we can demonstrate the different types of constraints. There are three equality constraints, inequality constraints, and balance constraints, which could also be inequality or equality constraints. I'm going to show you what those look like. Suppose x1 and x2 are different aspects of a problem over which we exercise discretion. They could be measured in inches or they could be uh, measured in volume or it's typically some it could be a material selection problem, some physical representation of our design. An equality constraint would require something like x1 is equal to a value. We're going to call this value, uh, just for the purposes of example, a 5. If our solution has to lie on this line, x1 equals 5. It's a very narrow constraint. x2, however, might be an inequality constraint. And we could express an inequality as less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. And in this case, we're going to say 8 and 2. Eight, two. Now, the feasible solutions, those that satisfy these two constraints have to be found on this line segment between x is less than or equal to 8 and x is greater than or equal to 2. Anything outside this line segment here, that is with x2, 9, or x2, 0, x1, 6, or x1, 4, is an infeasible solution. Feasible solutions satisfy all the constraint equations. Now let's consider this, this third, this special type of uh, balance constraint. We could also say, for example, that x1 plus x2 must equal 7. This narrows the problem further because we can draw another line, uh, x1 plus x2 equals 7. And what would it look like? When x1 is 0, then x2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, must be 7. As x1 increases, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then x2 would be 2. So here's another constraint. And we can see many places where the x1 plus x2 must be equal to 7 line is not satisfied. But there's one pl uh, place on the line segment where it is. So we could satisfy x1 equals 5. We could satisfy the inequality x2 must be less than or equal to 8 and greater than or equal to 2. And we could satisfy x1 plus x2 equals 7. And it occurs only at this point where all three equations are satisfied because they're all constraint equations. Despite the fact that some of them are inequalities, there's only one point that satisfies all three equations. And in this case, the feasible solution would be found at this one point where x1 must be 5, x2 is is 2, and the two of those values equals 7. My graph isn't very good. Um, but we'll find the point 5, 2, right at the terminus of the line segment. So now we understand what is the feasible region. The feasible region could be a segment, uh, it could be a point, or it could be 
an area, in this case two design variables, it could be a two-dimensional area. I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. We understand what the word feasible region means. We understand what infeasible means, that one of the constraint equations is not satisfied. We understand that constraints equations are written as either equalities or inequalities. And they could combine one or more of the design variables to create this special kind of balance equation. The balance equations could also be written as equalities or inequalities. And consider this example where x1 plus x2 must be less than or equal to 7. It would mean that the feasible range, according to this one equation, only this triangle of space, uh, sometimes we assume, a positivity constraint. It's especially true for physical parameters um, like concentration or thickness that cannot be negative. In this case, if x1 plus x2 were an inequality less than or equal to 7, then all of the space in here would satisfy just this one constraint, but it wouldn't satisfy the other constraint, this particularly the x1 equals 5. The solution in this case doesn't change because it's an inequality. I'm just pointing out that balance constraints contain two or more design variables, and they can be written as equality or inequality. So now we understand feasible, we understand the different types of constraint equations, and we understand infeasible uh, solutions aren't really solutions at all because they don't understand, uh, don't satisfy all the constraint equations, and we understand the different types of constraint equations. Let me run one more example for you that shows how this works. We're going to stick with our two different design variables, x1, x2. Let us plot a few constraints. This one would be x2 is less than or equal to 10. This one, x1 will be less than or equal to, uh, we'll call it 8. We're going to assume the positivity constraints again, which aren't always the case, but in this case they are. x1 and x2 must be greater than 0. In this simple square, we have a feasible region that is marked by the space greater than the x1 equals 0, greater than the x2 equals 0, it's actually a rectangle, and less than these other simple constraints. So everything in here is the feasible region and everything outside this two-dimensional space is infeasible because the constraint equations are not satisfied. What we haven't shown yet is an objective function. Suppose that we had an objective function that says maximize x1 plus x2. We'll write the value of the objective function as z. We want it to be maximized. And so mathematically, we want to choose the combination of design variables. Both of these are independent variable axes. We have discretion over them both. And we want to choose the combination of x1 plus x2 that will maximize this value of z. And intuitively, probably understand that z max is going to be found at x1 equals 8 and x2 equals 10. Any other solution, although feasible by satisfying all of the constraint equations listed here, all of them inequalities, although feasible, any solution found in this region is inferior because it has a lower value of the objective function. Our objective is to maximize z, and a solution like x1 equal to 2, x2 equal to 2, results not in a maximum z, but in a lesser z, an inferior z. So now we know that inferior solutions are superseded by a combination, a feasible combination of design variables that is superior. This particular point has special meaning. It's called an extreme point. And when we have a linear problem, 
all of the constraints are written as linear equations. The objective function is written as a linear equation. The solution will always be at an extreme point. I'll leave it to you to figure out why that is, and you may comment on it later. But there's two more points that I need to make. Once we've identified the optimum solution, and we understand that it is an extreme point, that means that some of the constraint equations will be satisfied as equalities, even though the constraints are written as inequalities. Once we've identified the extreme point that satisfies the objective function, that is z star is found at x1 equal to 8 and x2 equal to 10, these equations are satisfied as equalities because they define the extreme point. Those constraints are now active. The other constraints, these positivity constraints, inactive. They still bound the feasible region, but because the solution does not lie upon those equations, they are inactive constraints. And these other two are the active constraints that control the solution. One way to think about active constraints is if we were to change the constraint, then the optimum solution would change. Because the definition of an active constraint is that it is satisfied as an equality at the optimal solution, z star.